Welcome to the worship services of the First United Methodist Church, located at the head of Texas Street in downtown Shreveport, Louisiana. Join Senior Minister Dr. Pat Day as we worship this morning. This is probably the most practical message I've ever delivered, and I hope that you will take notes because I'm, my goal this morning is to help you to be a better decision maker. In the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, in the fifth to the sixth verses, a great passage that Solomon evidently inspired when he was inspired to write. When God asked Solomon that he could have anything in the world, riches, power, you name it, Solomon asked for one thing, Lord, grant me wisdom in decision making. And with 800 wives, that was a pretty good request. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. May God add His blessing to the reading of His holy and inspired Word. Many, many years ago as a young pastor, we were sitting around talking about how do you make wise decisions, and how do you know if it's a wise decision, and one of my friends held up his hand, I know it's a wise decision when my wife tells me it's a wise decision. Be nice if there would be that little person or that little voice that'd say, that's a good one, that's a bad one, but it doesn't work that way. So many times in life we just think that we can drift. And then we wake up and find ourselves far away from where we started and wonder, how in the world did I get here? How did I get in such a mess? No one ends up by accident where they are. It happens because we fail to make the right choices. No one plans to have a bad relationship. No one plans to go bankrupt. No one plans to work on a dead-end job the remainder of their life. No one sets out to drift through life without any clear purpose or destination, and yet millions and millions of people do so every day in our nation. Your decisions really do determine your destiny, and how can you make better decisions? How can you improve your batting average? That's my goal this morning. It begins by making wise decisions with the end in mind. Your life is a sum total of the decisions that you make, and every day you're consciously or unconsciously making hundreds of decisions that impact your life as well as the lives of others. Some of these decisions are insignificant and require very little thought, very little effort. In fact, they're effortless. They're just almost uh, one right after another. We do it so without even thinking. Others are much more complex and extremely, extremely important. They require a great deal of time and research and, and consultation with wiser people and, and studying the scriptures and thought and effort goes into it. Many people attempt to avoid decision making because of fear of making the wrong decision. Fear paralyzes us in the valley of decision. In fact, Albert Hubbard once said the greatest mistake a man can make is to be afraid of making one. How many times have you failed to move forward because you were fearful of choosing the wrong choice, or making the wrong choice? Former President Eisenhower once said, indecision is a decision. Albert Hubbard once said, the greatest mistake a man can make is to be afraid of making one, and so true in life. Being wrong or making a mistake paralyzes a lot of people, especially those that are perfectionists, that want to always do things perfectly. If you don't make your own decisions, someone else will. Earl Nightingale, one of my favorite writers of a different generation, said this. He said, the moment we choose not to make a decision about something, we put ourselves in the hands of circumstances or under the control of others who will make the decisions for us. And so this morning, I'd like to begin by saying there's not a 100% fail-proof method. But I can guarantee you this, if you will put into practice these six steps, it will up your batting average tremendously. So let's begin by looking at and open your worship built in the outline of the message. Step number one, determine the facts. Do your research. The father of modern day management, Dr. Peter Drucker, once said this, once the facts are clear, the decision will jump out at you. Once the facts are clear, the decision will jump out at you. Herbert E. Hawks once wrote, he said, half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make major decisions before they have sufficient knowledge. Gather information, do your homework, do the research. Don't just impulsively or impetuously make a decision. Get the facts before you do so. Thoroughly, 
thoroughly research and get all the facts that you can. Define the issue. Write out a simple statement of the issue or the problem. When people come to me for counseling, one of the things that I try to do early in the counseling session is, what is the problem? And the second thing is, what do you think you ought to do about it? Those are two of the most important things when you counsel another person. What information or facts do I need to know or gather? Many people make major decisions without thoroughly doing their research or doing their homework. And this leads to uh, uneducated enthusiasm, impulsively, impetuously, making decisions without any facts, without any research. Do everything in your power to gather and uncover the real facts concerning the decision that you're making. You will be amazed at the difference this first step will make and your decision-making process will be much more successful. Step number two, pray for guidance and wisdom. Wisdom is a practical application of knowledge when it comes to making the right decisions. James 1.5 states a passage that Gene read just a moment ago says, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This passage simply says, if you do not know what direction you should take, begin to ask God, because God is the author of wisdom. God wants you to know his will and his direction more than you do. He will give to you generously. God is not a stingy God. He wants to give, it, give wisdom to you lavishly, abundantly, more than you even need. Without any kind of reproach, it will be given to him. Praying for guidance involves asking, what does God want me to do in this situation? It involves asking God to give you the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2, 5 states, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In the beautiful passage that I started my message with this morning, the writer of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means to depend totally upon him as your source of wisdom. Put your entire, release it, place it in his hands and begin to say to him, Lord, I want to trust you in this issue. I'm not going to doubt you. I'm not going to question you. I just simply want to trust you to give me the insight, the wisdom that I need. This involves praying for guidance. This involves trusting God for the outcome. And lean not on your own understanding. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make is to leave God out of the decision-making process and to think that you know more and better than God does for your life. Praying and imagining yourself thinking with the mind of Christ is so important. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Ask others to pray for you as you attempt to discern the will of God in this particular area of your life. Give yourself time to prayerfully read the Bible. It's amazing what God will show you as you study the scriptures and ask and look for the Holy Spirit to direct you. Some good questions that I've used and have learned from other people to use is number one, is this the best thing for me to do? Number two, where will my decision ultimately lead me? Number three, will it bring glory to God? And number four, will it require a step of faith? It's amazing how so many times the decisions that we make require a step of faith. And I've learned the hard way that so many times when I don't take that step of faith and don't honor God, it's the wrong choice. Will it become an inspiration to others? Mr. J.L. Kraft, the founder of the giant uh, uh, food company, Kraft Foods, once said this, and it's something I read years and years ago as a young person that has helped me even to this day. I pray hard and I think hard. And when time is up, I must have the answer. I've done all the thinking and praying that I can do. I just say, Lord, please show me the next thing to do. And then says, Mr. Kraft, I believe the first idea that comes into my mind is the answer. And he added, I've been correct a large enough percentage of time to convince me that this process is sound. In every major decision in the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus drew a part to spend time in prayer discerning the will of God, asking God what he wanted him to do. When he chose the 12 disciples, he went away to a private area and began to pray and began to fast, asking God to show him that, who he should choose. Also, whenever he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, knew, knowing that the cross was looming in the very near future, knowing that he was going to be crucified, Jesus went to the, to the disciples and asked them, pray for me. I'm going through the valley of decision. I know that the cross is looming for me. Pray for me. And yet they, went asleep, they were asleep during this critical time that he needed them to pray for him. Sir John Marks Templeton was a great mutual fund founder of a past generation. 
who once said this, that he prayed before every investment decision for God's guidance and wisdom. And in his own opinion, his ability to make wise choices in the investment field were enhanced because of his prayer life and because he depended upon God to give him the insight and wisdom. Step three, seek the advice and counsel of others. Pride many times keeps us from asking for help and advice. Notice what Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But this is another qualifier. Lean not on your own understanding. In other words, don't think that you know what's best for you. Ask God, but also bring into your life wise people, men and women around you, that can help you make good decisions. Learn to listen to older and wiser people who've been there and done that. It will save you the problem of making countless mistakes. Life is too short, young people. Life is too short to learn everything by personal experience. Learn from others. Get around you a group of, cons- con- uh, of experts that can help you. Henry Ford once was asked the key to his success, and his answer was wise decisions. How do you get, make wise decisions? Experience. How do you get experience? By making stupid decisions. You know, you learn after you make enough stupid decisions not to make that same one. Build around you a team of consultants and experts. Look around this room. We have some of the most successful men and women in this entire community right here in the service this morning. If you're a young person and you're facing a major decision, call one of them. Meet with them after church. Invite them to lunch. And sit down and and share the problem that you're facing or the decision that you need to reach. We have many, many men and women that would be honored and be blessed for you to ask them their opinion and ask them for counsel and for, to mentor you in this particular area. A mastermind principal or, or executive team develop a close circle of friends of people who you know well and who have your best interests at heart. Now the wrong person to ask, now listen carefully, the wrong person to ask to seek advice from are those who will, affected, will be affected positively or negatively by your decision, but will be advised based on their interest and not on yours. In your own family, your spouse, or someone that is a wise decision maker. One of the, the people that I leaned on for so many years was my dad, who was a wonderful businessman and had a great deal of wisdom. Maybe not a lot of degrees on the wall, but he was a very, very brilliant man, and his wisdom saved me from making a lot of mistakes. And one of the things that I miss about him not being here anymore is the ability that we had just to sit down and bounce things off of each other. Step number four, be sensitive to your intuition. Be sensitive to your intuition. Intuition is one of those mysterious things that uh, it's kind of, for some people, hocus pocus, but it really isn't. When making decisions, do you tend to depend more on facts or upon hunches? Neither one is better than others. It was my privilege this past week to, to listen to a very brilliant op- entrepreneur from Texas, a billionaire entrepreneur who had made a lot of wise decisions in his life. Red McCombs was his name. And Mr. McCombs talked about the X factor, the hunch factor. Many times in business decisions, following that hunch, following that X factor, as he referred to it as, is one of the keys to making successful decisions. What he was talking about is intuition. It is important to know whether you're an intuitive or a logical decision maker. In my opinion, there needs to be a balance between the two. Neither one is simply right or wrong. You need both. Good decision-making involves both intuition as well as logical thinking. Intuition is what we know without knowing for certain. Intuition is a learned skill as well as a God-given gift. Intuition is based upon the premise that you must have the guts to follow the hunch. Self-confidence is key to intuitive decision-making, and many of the great inventors and discoverers of our world and of history have been very intuitive in their decision-making. Dr. Joyce Brothers writes, she says, trust your hunches. They are usually based upon facts filed just below the conscious level. Art Fry, for instance, who worked for 3M, was in the choir. He kept noticing every time he'd put those slips of paper in there to, to where the, the next hymn was going to be would slide out. And so he began to think of somehow or another putting a, uh, that piece of paper in there where you could pull it out and it not tear up the page or disfigure the page. And as a process, he created the post-it notes 
Louis Pasteur, the French chemist and microbiologist, was examining some fermented grapes when he realized that the grapes ferment only when the skin is broken. He knew that bacterial infection was caused by germs in the air, not by spontaneous internal generation. He proved though, through a series of experiments this important concept which led to what we now know as pasteurization. When Ray Kroc tried to buy the McDonald's brothers out of their hamburger business, they stunned him by asking $2.7 million for their interest. And Kroc recalled, I'm not a gambler. I didn't have all that kind of money. But my funny bone instinct kept urging me on. And so I closed my door, cursed up and down, threw things out the window, and then I called my lawyer and told him, take it. It was a smart decision, however. Their shares soon were worth $15 million a year to Ray Kroc. Then in 1928, Alexander Fleming was about to throw away some bacteria that he had been cultivating. A mold growth was co contaminating the culture. But before disposing of the culture, he noticed a bacteria-free circle around the mold growth. A hunch led him to investigate it further. And he found a substance in the mold that prevented growth in the bacteria, even when he diluted it 800 times. He called it penicillin. Then King Gillette was a salesman who sold cork that went inside bottle caps. It fascinated him that people would pay him for the same thing over and again, over again and throw it away, a disposable item that people kept by rebuying time after time. And then he began to think, what else can I come up with that people will buy and then throw away and buy it again? And that's when he hit upon the idea of disposable razor blades. King Gillette has spent his entire business life working with people who sold disposable items to the public. If something goes beyond the logic that we understand, we say forget it. The biggest roadblock to intuitive decision making is not having the guts to follow the hunch. Bad decisions leave scars in our life and therefore we're so fearful of making another that we won't reach out. Step number five, pardon me, five. Got six up there. Got ahead of myself, five. Just want to see if you're awake. List all the possible alternatives and their advantages and disadvantages. Every decision has its consequences. Every time you make a decision and say yes to one thing, you automatically say no to something else. You can't have it both ways. When you make decisions, rarely do you get everything that you wanted in making that single decision. And every decision we make ultimately will be the results of weighing two major factors, the advantages versus the disadvantages. Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter in 1722 that has impacted more people in this era than anything that I know of, in which he had this to say about decision making. My way is to take a sheet of paper, divide it in half, right, put a line right down the middle. On one side, put pros. On the other side, put cons. And then I began to add up the pros and cons. And when I get the tally, I move forward on that decision in that particular area. Don't procrastinate. Sometimes sleeping on a problem or a major decision allows time for one's subconscious mind to contribute to the solution. But when one's request to sleep on it turns into a Rip Van Winkle hibernation, then it becomes an escape mechanism. Your decision is a spark that ignites an action. Until a decision is made, nothing can happen. Until you move forward, nothing can happen. In the passage that Gene read, it said, ask for, for wisdom. And when you receive that wisdom, move forward confidently, decisively, courageously, not doubting, not second-guessing yourself, not questioning and not feeling uneasy about the decision you made, but move forward as though that is the decision God wanted you to make. Norman Vincent Peale many years ago shared this uh, in one of his books. He said, you know, whenever I believe this about life, I believe I'm divinely guided in my decisions. And even when I make a bad decision, God has a way of transforming that bad decision into something that will ultimately benefit me as well as those that I'm serving. Your decision is a spark that ignites action. After you make your decision, don't continue to hash it over. Don't to get, to continue to discuss it. And for God's sake, don't second guess yourself. Move forward. Step number six, make sure the timing is right. When do you make the big decision? The right time. When you're attitudinally, emotionally, and spiritually up and not down. The wrong time is when you're emotionally and attitudinally down. 
you can make some of the biggest mistakes in your life when you're not emotionally or spiritually or, or mentally at your A game. So many times people make major decisions when they're in the valley of depression. I can guarantee you those decisions are going to turn out wrong nine times out of ten. When I was a young person and just learning about investments, I had made an investment and, and I was going through a, a, a down time in my life and, and I just called the broker up and said, well, just sell it. You know, this has been a horrible week and might as well just sell that. Well, two weeks later, the company that I'd sold, the shares that I'd sold, had doubled and was bought out by another company. It cost me $3,000. It was the best $3,000 education I've ever learned. I don't make decisions when I'm in down times anymore. And I try to counsel those who come to me not to do the same thing. Patience is required to keep from running ahead to make a decision instead of holding off until the time is right. Learn from your mistakes and don't call them mistakes. Call them an education. Call them an education. Keep lying to yourself. Tell you, it'll help you feel better. <laughs> the wrong decision at the wrong time equals disaster. The wrong decision at the right time equals a mistake. The right decision at the wrong time equals an acceptance. The right decision at the right time equals success. Knowing when to get in and knowing when to get out is a real art. Mr. McCone said that the problem is staying with a, with a bad decision too long is one of the worst business decisions that he's ever seen. He said, cut your losses and move on. How many times have you got into something and you just keep trying to turn it around, keep trying to turn around, keep trying to turn around, and it's not going to ever turn around on this side of eternity? Those are two rules to good decision making. Rule number one, make the decision. Don't look back and second guess yourself. Rule number two, if you're still in doubt, wait, wait, don't move forward. There are many ways that God guides. Sometimes he says, go, move forward with courage, with confidence in the direction that he's leading. Sometimes he says, no, do not choose that course of action and do not attempt to knock down the door once it has been slammed in your face. Number three, sometimes God says, slow, slow down. Take additional time to think through and pray through and make your decision. And number four, sometimes God says grow. In and through the decision-making process, many times we have to grow emotionally and spiritually and mentally before we make the right decision. There is one decision that I will guarantee you that will help you make better decisions, and that is the decision to go with Jesus Christ, to make him your senior partner in life. Many people are in the valley of decisions this morning. Many of you are right there this morning. And if you have not made Jesus Christ a senior partner of your life, then I encourage you to do so. That is one decision you will never, ever regret. I love the little chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have defined, decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Have you ever made that great decision to go with Christ? It's the greatest decision that you'll ever make. It's one that you don't ever have to second guess. It's the one that will bring blessing into your life and tremendous guidance into your life in ways that nothing else can. If there were no other reason for me to be a Christian, no other reason for me to be a Christian, at the top of the list would be the fact that Jesus Christ in my life has made all the difference when it comes to making decisions. Have I batted a thousand? Heavens no. But I know one thing for sure. I'm better at making decisions with the Lord in my life than it was when I didn't have him there. That's one decision you will never have to regret is having him as a senior partner in your life because he can do things in and through you you can never do under your own power. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much that of all the major decisions that we face, what are we going to do with you is the, is the number one. Will we make you the Lord of our life or will we leave you out of our life? Every decision that we face in life will be much more easily handled because you have because we have your guidance and your direction to help us in making those decisions. Father, I just pray right now for the gift of wisdom to be given to every person in the sound of my voice. I pray for discernment, and I pray for godly understanding, and I pray for enlightenment in a way that they have never, ever experienced before. And for every person facing a major decision this day or this week or in the future, that you will be with them to guide them and they will be open and receptive and lean upon you, Lord, and not upon their own 
understanding. Thank you, dear Lord. Amen. You've been watching the worship services of the First United Methodist Church, located at the head of Texas Street in downtown Shreveport, Louisiana. We welcome you to join us in person next Sunday at 8.30 or 11 a.m. For more information about First United Methodist Church of Shreveport, please visit our website at www.fumcshreveport.org.